capitalism, all of the gains in automation, it goes to the owner class. All you have to do is have everyone be an owner, and now suddenly, any gain in automation is a gain for everybody. If you grow just one thing, it may not grow as well as if it grows with another thing. A good example of that is called the, the Three Sisters Method of Farming. There is definitely multi-apartment buildings or multi-families that do do a passive A hundred million dollars that they gave to Joe Rogan that they would kind of be out if they breach contract. Is that a bigger number? Or is two billion a bigger number? <laughs> It's a tough one. I know. Really hard. And maybe, maybe yes. comparing numbers is not uh, Jeremy Strong. Gotta go kill a Jenny. I still don't think you should kill her. I don't think it's a good idea. It's a ghost, dude. I was not prepared. Uh, welcome back, everybody, to Bread Theory. Tonight, we are going to be continuing on with uh, People's History of the United States by Howard Zinn, uh, one of the most important text that that uh, does not just take u.s history and, and polish it up uh, and and sanitize it for you know the the idea being that uh that's what children can handle and stuff and that they should be <clears throat> uh proud of their country no matter what what the facts say so it does not do that does not indulge in in myth making and and uh revisionist history it just tries to take the most clear-eyed view of American history or history of North America that it possibly can. And so far, it has uh, been very revelatory. It's, it's shown a lot of things that, that a lot of people don't like thinking about or talking about, um, especially if you want to believe that this country is and always has been on the, the side of right, and even when it gets stuff wrong, it eventually corrects it. No, in, instead we've seen that there's been a long pattern of keeping down the people that start from the the lowest power rungs um, completely to advantage uh, white European men uh, and landowning men at that so we've been through a lot we've been through the <clears throat> Revolutionary War Zinn talked about how that was uh, how uh, the poor were, were more or less tricked into to serving in it with promises of, of getting better social standing than they had under the, the King George, uh, which by and large did not materialize afterward. They, they just had a new master and were just told they were more free because they no longer had a king. So there's that. Uh, we are on to broken Native American treaties right now. Uh, learned quite a lot last time, and we have a lot more to delve into. Um, see, last night, <coughs> before we get going here, so I mentioned that last night we started a new project uh, together, uh, myself and, and you all, the audience. We are putting together an audiobook version of Permaculture, a Designer's Manual, uh, perhaps the most important permaculture text in existence it's kind of the forms the backbone of the permaculture design certificate class and contains the the bulk of the really good ideas that bill mellison managed to assemble and create himself um so there is no audiobook version of it it's a difficult book to turn into an audiobook because there are so many illustrations but together we're gonna we're gonna crowdsource some ideas for uh, image descriptions and and ways of just putting things together so that anyone, no matter where they're coming from or, or what uh, disadvantages they may have, uh, is able to enjoy, you know, at least one version of the text because it's been largely unavailable to people that, that couldn't just read it in print form. Now, they've, they've come a long way in, in making the print form freely available there's there's a number of sites where you can download a copy for free but that doesn't really help people that don't have the time the ability the will to read print um, and the the version of that print also does not work well with text readers it's it's a basically a photocopied version um, and so not everything 
came over well and not everything translates well to a, a text-to-speech program, not least of which the illustrations, which are just completely skipped over, aside from perhaps their image descriptions that already exist in the book. <clears throat> Ah, uh, let's see, other news before we get going here. Um, Amanda, unfortunately, has come down with COVID. She she did test positive this morning. I'm still testing negative, but I'm, I'm starting to feel some, perhaps, sy- symptoms. So we'll see how that goes. I'm getting some, uh, some congestion. You might even be able to hear it in my voice. Throat's getting a little bit scratchy. So far, nothing real major. Um, and like I said, I, I tested negative this morning, but I'm going to retest tomorrow morning just in case. But uh, there's a good chance I may end up with it as well. And uh, luckily I have PTO saved up, so financially I'll be okay. However, um, that that kind of blows most of my, my PTO that I have. I'll have like one more day after that uh, in the bank still. So I better not get sick after that point this year. Um, but then beyond that, too, <clears throat> uh, it could be seen as a, as a potentially good thing, because if I do end up having to stay home for like a week or something like that, I do plan to stream more often um, as, as, as the illness in my body allows. That's the plan, if, if that's the way things go. But we'll see. Probably going to be less, you know, of this sort of streaming where we're, we're doing a deep dive into a text, probably more casual streaming, reaction stuff, video game streaming, that sort of thing. Um, but we'll see how things go. We'll see. We'll see what that test says tomorrow morning. Um, but I, yeah, getting less and less hopeful by the hour here. That I'm going to avoid it. I usually avoid whatever Amanda gets. Somehow, I just my immune system just sloughs it right off. Um, but uh, perhaps this time I've, I've managed to catch it still. So we'll see. All right. <clears throat> Anything else? So we're into October now. So I do want to mention that every fourth Friday of the month we do have a leftist karaoke stream only on my Bread Theory channel on Twitch. It is a live-only event. There's no recording of it until I make one. I still have not gotten around to making the recording of the last one, so that's not out yet. But I will. I will eventually. Um, and uh, But it's usually a fun time. And uh, if you're someone who wants to sing, come on the stream and, and, and sing for everybody. Uh, that's, that's certainly... A possibility for you. All you gotta do is reach out to me wherever you're finding this, and I will make sure that you get this the special join code whenever we start. So the fourth Friday of the month, let's look it up together right now. So we're already into October. Have not had a Friday yet in October. So 7, 14, 21, the 28th will be the next one. So that's Halloween weekend. Uh, I may have to reevaluate this uh, fourth Friday thing because it seems that when it coincides with uh, a holiday or a day off or something like that, it tends to be less well attended. And I was hoping the opposite would be true, that it would give people who feel like getting away and and doing something different um, but still getting together and socializing with people, give them a a way to do that. So far, that's, that's not been the case. But we'll see. For now, we're going to say it's it's uh, Friday, October 28th for the next Leftist Karaoke stream. So at least come in and show up. We've, we've had a very supportive audience. You all have been great through that. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's just a fun time. But uh, it's, it's at 9 p.m. Central Standard Time every fourth Friday of the month. Twitch, bread underscore theory. So mark your calendars. All right, let's get into the book for tonight. And as always, just mention once again, this is a place of learning. Uh, the only bad questions are those act- asked in bad faith. So as long as you, you earnestly want to know the answer to something and you're not being a dick about it, um, I'll do my best to, to answer without judging or, or chastising you. Um, so yeah, I want this to be a, a welcoming space. 
Absolutely. Because, you know, I'm learning stuff too. It's not as though I'm some, you know, grandmaster just sitting uh, uh, above all of you and you have to just bow at my feet and, and take whatever I say as, as gospel. Far from it. I'm just an average person who likes reading theory and likes thinking about it and, and puzzling it out with all of you. Nothing more, nothing less. But with that being said, let's get to this portion of the book for tonight. So here we are. So we're just about a, quarter of the, or a third of the way through. Between a quarter and a third, I would say. Um, and as usual, I will pause for commentary and whatnot, and to, to read your comments as well. So keep them coming. Here we go. Blackhawk's bitterness may, may have come in part from the way... Okay, so to catch you back up, we're, we are talking... In fact, let's, let's move back to that last quote that we stopped with last time. It was a good one. Uh, so this is a Native American Blackhawk who is speaking. And he's kind of uh, chastising the European settlers. Let's look back to me. Okay, he's got a long speech here. But we'll go over it one more time just to refresh your memory or give you the first. It was not in combat. When Chief Pass Black Hawk was defeated go. and captured in 1832, he made a surrender speech. I fought hard, but your guns were well aimed. The bullets flew like birds in the air and whizzed by our ears like the wind through the trees in the winter. My warriors fell around me, the sun rose dim on us in the morning, and at night it sunk in a dark cloud and looked like a ball of fire. That was the last sun that shone on Black Hawk. He is now a prisoner to the white men. He has done nothing for which an Indian ought to be ashamed. He has fought for his countrymen, the squaws and papooses against white men who came year after year to cheat them and take away their lands. You know the cause of our making war. It is known to all white men. They ought to be ashamed of it. Indians are not deceitful. The white men speak bad of the Indian and look at him spitefully, but the Indian does not tell lies. Indians do not steal. An Indian who is as bad as the white men could not live in our nation. He would be put to death and eaten up by the wolves. The white men are bad. And that, that might seem like hyperbole, like, you know, he's making an over-the-top statement to, to make a point, but after having read David Graeber's... Uh, the dawn of everything, it seems that that notion was a lot more common uh, across a vast assortment of, of Native American tribes than uh, a more European style one that, that believed in hierarchy and stuff. Like, for, for it seems like the vast majority of the tribes that, that David Graeber covered anyway, they thought of the white man as, as really pitiful, or the average white man, I should say, uh, you know always uh, prostrating themselves and, and uh, bowing down to uh, the, the chain of command and hierarchy and trembling any time a, a noble person came by for fear that they do the wrong thing and get smacked down for it, all this stuff. It seems as though leadership was thought of very differently by most of these tribes. And that's not to say that there was no such thing as, as say, coercion or... or you know, everyone was just as free as everyone else. That that probably was not the case by and large. But the idea that there were strict hierarchies that were immutable and behave or, or function the same no matter the season or the time or the, the state of things, whether you were at peace or at war, that seemed quite foreign to, uh, to most of the tribes in, in North America. At least the ones, as I say, chronicled by David Graeber. Um, so, yeah. 
bad schoolmasters. They carry false books and deal in false actions. They smile in the face of the poor Indian to cheat him. They shake them by the hand to gain their confidence, to make them drunk, to deceive them, and ruin our wives. We told them to leave us alone and keep away from us. They followed on and beset our paths. And they coiled themselves among us like the snake. They poisoned us by their touch. We were not safe. We lived in danger. We were becoming like them. Hypocrites and liars. A and again, realize that the, the point of view of these white settlers was that Native Americans were savages. You know, they still, you know, Ayn Rand would, would constantly refer to Native Americans as savages. Uh, and she clearly thought of them that way. She believed very much in strict hierarchies and that, of course, the European was at the top of her hierarchy, uh, despite somehow being <laughs> fawned over by so-called libertarians. But uh, yeah, they thought of these people as, as completely uneducated, uneducatable, and just basically cavemen with a, a little bit prettier dress. Um, but as you can see from this, this one uh, Black Hawk chief, and that's not the case. They they were just as they were every bit as as capable of, of being eloquent and and uh, analyzing their, their the state of themselves in relation to other peoples, um, capable of analyzing the the ways of the the European settlers, just as well as any anthropologist could. So, if you take anything away from from this book and 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 others uh, about. Native Americans, such as, again, uh, the dawn of everything, it should be that people are basically the same, no matter where they're from or the circumstances of their birth. They about all have the same potential for eloquence and poetry and analysis and uh, philosophy and all of these sorts of things. So, and that extends across both space and time. There's no time where people were just dumb there's no time where people were more enlightened. People are just people, and there's just a, a, a standard distribution of all sorts of skills and talents across people regardless. The main differences are opportunity, and that includes both the, 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 you know, having the physical ability to maintain yourself to a point where you can do things like philosophy, um, but also having a supportive community or not, uh, one that, that does value people rising up from wherever they are to reach their highest potential. Those are the differences among human civilizations. There's nothing inherently different about one human civilization or another. It doesn't matter what you're talking about. It's, it's, it's all cultural constructs and material conditions. That's, that's what guides how things shake out in the end. So one of those things we can change pretty, I mean, you can change your material conditions too, but that can be more difficult than changing the culture, especially in a, a very uh, hard and fast hierarchy, such as one that is developed by capitalism. It'd be very hard to change the, cult, the uh, material conditions of one's existence, especially with so many debt traps being being set for everybody. Not lucky enough to be, you know, have Vanderbilt as their last name or some such thing. Uh, so, yeah, but we can change culture. We can change the ideas that hold currency. And you can see that in, in American culture in the fact that being openly racist was considered just fine and dandy during Jim Crow times and is now considered quite taboo. Um, that's, that's a difference and that's a good difference. I would say that's a good thing that, that our, our society does not view racism as even passive or neutral, but actively malicious these days. Whether or not they act on it is a different matter, but at least there's in the cultural zeitgeist, the idea that it's not cool to be racist, or at least openly racist, or, you know, 
uh, aware of, of how racist you are and do nothing about it, right? So, so yeah, so there's hope. That's, that's, that's really the, the bullet point to take away. There's hope for change. We can make and remake whatever society we like. Uh, it just takes the, the will and the opportunity. Adulterous, lazy drones, all talkers and no workers. The white men do not scalp the head, but they do worse. They poison the heart. Hmm. Farewell, my nation. Farewell to Black Hawk. Black Hawk's bitterness may have come in part from the way he was captured. Without enough support to hold out against the white troops, with his men starving, hunted, pursued across the Mississippi, Black Hawk raised the white flag. The American commander later explained, As we neared them, they raised a white flag and endeavored to decoy us, but we were a little too old for them. The soldiers fired, killing women and children as well as warriors. Black Hawk fled. He was pursued and captured by Sioux in the hire of the army. Hmm. A government agent told the Sac and Fox Indians, Our great father will forbear no longer. He has tried to reclaim them and they grow worse. He is resolved to sweep them from the face of the earth. If they cannot be made good, they must be killed. Be like us or we'll genocide you. <laughs> That's, that's that, that, that high, noble aspirations of, of the white settlers of the time, or at least the ones in control of things. Uh, do as we do, or you don't deserve existence. Hmm. <laughs> Maybe at the very least not something worthy of reverence and, and continue, continue to praise of. Um, and these people are after the time of the Founding Fathers, even. So, supposedly, even more enlightened, but not really. Because they still have hierarchy and capitalism, first and foremost, in, in, the mind of, in their minds. The removal of the Indians was explained by Louis Cass, Secretary of War, Governor of the Michigan Territory, Minister to France, Presidential Candidate, quote, A principle of progressive improvement seems almost inherent in human nature. We are all striving in the career of life to acquire riches of honor or power or some other object whose possession is to realize the daydreams of our imaginations. And the aggregate of these efforts constitutes the advance of society. But there is little of this in the constitution of our savages. Cass, pompous, pretentious, honored, Harvard gave him an honorary Doctor of Laws degree in 1836 at the height of Indian removal, claimed to be an expert on the Indians, but he demonstrated again and again, in Richard Drennan's words, violence in the American experience, winning the West, a, quote, quite marvelous ignorance of Indian life, unquote. As governor of the Michigan Territory, Cass took millions of acres from the Indians by treaty. Quote, we must frequently promote their interest against their inclination. His article in the North of... So again, treating them like children at best. You know, small, uh, uh, small-minded children, you know, incapable of, of uh, taking care of themselves. So doing them a kindness to, to take away the, their vast tracts of land that they don't know how to use. Not like, not like the, the European settlers do. Um, it's just, the, the juxtaposition of just being so highly arrogant, looking down your nose at, at, at people so much, and yet treating them so monstrously at the same time that you are orders of magnitude more horrific uh, on the whole. Than they are in, in terms of, of culture and and values and all of that stuff it's just i don't know i don't know a good word for for what it makes me feel but it's not good uh yeah but you know this is the the pattern we've seen again and again the people in power thinking that uh, you know infantilizing everyone below them 
especially those of, of different culture or skin tone, uh, using that as a justification to treat them in the worst ways imaginable uh, with, without a shred of humanity towards them and still thinking you are superior in every way. I guess just because you have the ability to enact horrific violence at will and in greater magnitude than they do. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me. American Review in 1830 made the case for Indian removal. We must not regret, he said, Quote, the progress of civilization and improvement, the triumph of industry and art. See, again, if you're only looking at, at material progress, fine. But if that material progress is coming at the expense of all moral progress, in fact, sending it back to the worst depths of what humans are capable of, it's difficult to say that on the whole, things are progressing. Even if overall everyone is more better off materially. I mean, I, I, it is like that. I don't know. I don't know if it's quite a cliche, but it's it's the the adage. Uh, what profit a man to gain the world and lose his soul? Was it people are more valuable than silver and gold? Let me look up the right quote. And this is an adage that really ring. Oh yeah, it's it's part of it's a Bible quote. In fact, Mark eight verse thirty four to thirty eight. For what should it profit a man if he shall gain the world, and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and my words in this audience and sinful generations of him, shall the Son of Man be ashamed? When he cometh to the glory of the Father, is all the end. Okay, so that's. Hmm. And it's, uh, it's, you know, it's something that still rings pretty true today in this age as the constant battle between, oh, we have to have, maintain our way of life. We can't think of giving up fossil fuels or, or having social justice because, you know, give up fossil fuels, that will just be chaos. You just chaos everywhere. Uh, how will we have power at night, according to Marjorie Taylor Greene? Um, uh, they, they see it as just a slide backwards in, in the material comfort of society and therefore just a, an overall slide backwards. But what if it comes to the point where we have to make serious decisions about whether we're going to extract more energy from this earth at the expense of losing everything in the future, of not having a, a habitable planet for humans, um, at the expense of the, the constant and increasing uh, natural disasters we're seeing, such as the the Again, what, what do they call this most recent hurricane in Florida? It was is a thousand-year hurricane, maybe? Let's just look it up real quick. These, these towns are just being wiped off the map. And thankfully, because of disaster preparedness, the, the death toll for so much destruction is much less than it, it has been in the past. But 40,000 people are already displaced. Uh, at least 88 people are, are dead or presumed dead. Uh, let's see if, if we add once in a to that phrase so 
See, Hurricane Irma in 2017 was called a once-in-a-lifetime tidal event. Uh, Ian, the most recent one in Florida, one of the strongest hurricanes ever to strike the United States. One of the strongest. Category 4, I believe. Yeah, that's. I, don't, I think it might go to, her, to Category 5, but... I mean, obviously, 80,000 people displaced, that's some serious power in a system. But, I mean, these, these events just keep happening. These thousand-year floods, thousand-year hurricanes, thousand-year storms, thousand-year droughts happening within, you know, the span of a decade or two or even just a few years. This is not coincidental. So, back to the, the, the adage, what profit a man to gain the world and lose the soul? What profit a, a people to gain dizzying heights of material comfort, but lose their ability to <laughs> reproduce generations into the future that can live on a habitable planet? So, in, the, in this passage that we just covered, you have a Native American person telling white settlers basically the same thing. You know, for all of your, your dazzling technology, you're so barbaric and cruel that, that how can you say that you're better than us? And how can you? How can anyone look back and say that these people were superior in any way other than just technologically? And that only through an, an accident of, of location, really. Um, being in a place where, I mean, there's, there's a lot of theories about how, why some civilizations rise uh, or here or there when, when others aren't. And it just happened to be that Europe, especially England, was in the right place at the right time to be the recipient of a lot of technological advances that allowed them to dominate the known world, basically. But they were not the first civilization to do so. They, they, I mean, hopefully they'll be the... I mean, America is right now. But hopefully America will be the last civilization to feel the need to dominate absolutely all known parts of the, the planet. Um, yeah, all right. Losing my, my train of thought here, so we'll continue on. By which these regions have been reclaimed, and over which freedom, religion, and science are extending their sway. I don't know how you can, in the same speech, talk about wanting to wipe off the map, uh, entire peoples and then talk about how freedom is extending its sway and religion <laughs> there's like a very specific religion in mind there i'm sure um he wished that all this could have been done with quote a smaller sacrifice that the aboriginal population had oh they just they just had to go they were just standing in the way of progress Ugh. What a, what, a, what a tragic confluence of, of historical events. Just no other way to do it. You couldn't possibly try to live in coexistence with them. Couldn't possibly try to, I don't know, even learn from them. Uh, take on some of their ideas. Have a, have a real cultural exchange where, you know, you treat each other as, as equals in humanity. Um couldn't possibly just try to live alongside one, one another. No, you have to, you have to put a, together your entire manifest destiny arc and uh, talk about it, how it just had to be done to achieve greater progress because they will never accept your way of life and therefore they will never uh, use the earth the way God intended it to. That's what's implicit in all of what this man is saying. Continuing on. 
had accommodated themselves to the inevitable change of their condition, but such a wish is vain. A barbarous people depending for subsistence on the scanty and precarious supplies furnished by the chase cannot live in contact with a civilized community. Civilized. Of the two, there's not really a record that I know of of any Native American tribe committing utter genocide against another. There is record from the beginning of this book you know, the, the very first contact of people, you know, it was an island off the coast of, of North America, but still, the, the Arawaks are no more. They were wiped from history. Uh, and as far as I know, none of them escaped being completely, deliberately uh, genocided by Columbus and his men. But they're the, they're the barbarous ones, not the new settlers who are willing to commit genocide if, if every term is not met, if their hunger for land is not satiated endlessly, if, they, if the natives don't just keep on giving up more and more ground until they only have the worst spots uh, for human subsistence left in the country. That's, that's the civilization that you want to promote, one that, one that will do that to another people. So again, don't conflate material progress with social progress. They can be very different things. Drinnen comments on this, writing in 1969, quote, Here were all the necessary grounds for burning villages and uprooting natives, Cherokee and Seminole, and later Cheyenne, Philippine, and Vietnamese. If the Indians would only move to new lands across the Mississippi, Cass promised in 1825 at a treaty council with Shawnees and Cherokees, quote, The United States will never ask for your land there. This I promise you in the name of your great father, the president. That country he assigns to his red people to be held by them and their children's children forever. I mean, you gotta wonder if even they believe their own words when they say stuff like that. I would bet no, or at best they are convincing themselves of something that they really in their heart of hearts know is not true. Just for expediency's sake. Because again, you have to, it's okay to lie to children if it's for the cause of the greater good, right? And since they have such a paternal view of themselves towards the, the natives, then they have no problem, you know, telling them white lies if it keeps the peace. Uh, the problem being that they know that, they, they have to know that that's, that's, that's not going to be kept forever or even for the next decade. And really, it doesn't have to. It just has to, to hang on until the next person in charge says, oh, whoops, I, we meant, you know, 100 miles past the Mississippi. I mean, 200 miles, uh, 500 miles. You know, it just, because then that, that original person who said, oh, well, I promise you this will never go further. Well, they're already out of power. So they didn't lie. It's just that it's out of their hands now. Other people made other decisions. Yeah, the, the, I guess civilization marches on, though, huh? The editor of the North American Review, for whom Cass wrote this article, told him that his project, quote, only defers the fate of the Indians. In half a century, their condition beyond the Mississippi will be just what it is now on this side. Their extinction is inevitable. As Drennan notes, Cass did not dispute this, oh, yet so published his article as it was. Knew it was a lie. Everything Said it in anyway. the Indian heritage spoke out against all in the name of civilization and manifest destiny. Leaving their land. A council of Creeks offered money for their land, said, We would not receive money for land in which our fathers and friends are buried. An old Choctaw chief said, responding years before to President Monroe's talk of removal, I am sorry I cannot comply with the request of my father. We wish to remain here, where we have grown up as the herbs of the woods, and do not wish to be transplanted into another soil. 
A Seminole Pretty chief reasonable. had said to John Quincy Adams, Here our naval strings were first cut, and the blood from them sunk into the earth and made the country dear to us. Not all the Indians responded to the white officials' common designation of them as children and the president as father. It was reported that when Tecumseh met with William Henry Harrison, Indian fighter and future president, the interpreter said, your father requests you to take a chair. Tecumseh replied, my father? The sun is my father and the earth is my mother. I will repose upon her bosom. As soon as... Damn straight. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. The, the, the Europeans really just dug into this idea that they were the, the great fathers of the natives, the, the wardens of these, these childlike people in the woods. Um, but you got to figure that any of them who actually came in contact with, with more than a handful of natives would have come across some that were well-spoken, just as well-spoken as them, just as good at logic and oration and all of these sorts of things, like in, this, in the case of this meeting here. So... There has to have at least been something gnawing at the, the back of their mind about that notion that they were just the, the fatherly figures because they happen to have more advanced technology. The question remains, though, like, like, like what could the natives have done at this time? Like Tecumseh tried to unite a bunch of, of Native American tribes against the Europeans to go to war literally at them for their own survival he saw what was coming and and saw it correctly um that they would just keep getting pushed further and further and pushed more and more towards the brink of utter annihilation and he wanted to fight against it uh, he was unsuccessful in, in rallying together enough people to resist the the white man but you wonder what what could have they done they were they were native groups that that tried to assimilate into white culture that 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 uh, you know may have been nomadic or semi nomadic and gave up that lifestyle in favor of farming and settling down into a, a European agrarian lifestyle adopted the clothing the the speech all the stuff and were still pushed off their lands onto the Trail of Tears. So, so I, and I, this is this is just a question I'm asking that I have no actual answer for, but what else, what, what could have been done against that juggernaut of, of uh, American um, manifest destiny and, and uh, entitlement to the lands of other peoples? Utter, utter, uh, you know, they were utterly convinced that they deserve to have all that stuff, all that land, all those places, and that natives were, at best, an inconvenience to be swept out of the way, you know, children in the woods to be shooed along so that the, the grown-ups can do what's meant to be done with the land. How do you, I mean, how you, you couldn't, I don't think they could have fought that head-on. They didn't have the same technology, and perhaps they could have you know, stolen enough of it to make a stand, but the, 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 it would be like, I don't know, it would be like a, a small country today, say Iraq, we'll, we'll go with Iraq, trying to hold out against the, the onslaught and the occupation of the U.S. military. They're not going to put up much of a fight, doesn't matter how many people are on board with the notion of, of holding out foreign invaders, uh, it's not going to happen. The U.S. just has such vast military superiority that they can go wherever they want and take whatever they want. And there's not really a force on Earth, other than perhaps the combined force of the rest of the Earth, that could really stop at least the invasion part. Now, now Afghanistan and, and Vietnam and Korea have shown that you can battle the U.S. to a stalemate. You can eventually wear them down to the point where they will leave. But still, it's not as though the influence is completely gone. We have tons of military bases in South Korea. We have a lot in Japan. Uh, we have a 
lot in in the regions of all the places that we have formerly gone to war with and invaded. So it's not as though it's just gone once the, you know, the fighting stops and the war is declared over. So that's that's still the the eternal question. How do you oppose what seems to be an overwhelming, unstoppable power? Uh, I just, I don't know the answer to that. As Jackson was elected president, Georgia, Alabama, and Mississippi began to pass laws to extend the state's rule over the Indians in their territory. These laws did away with the tribe as a legal unit, outlawed tribal meetings, took away the chief's powers, made the Indians subject to militia duty and state taxes, but denied them the right to vote, to bring suits, or to testify in court. Indian territory was divided up to be distributed by state lottery. Whites were encouraged to settle on Indian land. However, federal... Just mulling over that question more, I think really the only thing that they could have done was just an all-out campaign of guerrilla-style warfare, uh, focusing on the supply lines of the United States. Because if there's one Achilles heel to any empire, uh, especially big ones that are extended across vast territories, it is supply lines. That is the lifeblood of, of any um, of any empire. I mean, that's that's half the reason that they make an empire in the first place is to conquer places and take their stuff to feed the machine that is empire. Um, so if you can disrupt that enough, and as we've seen with COVID, even supposedly invincible uh, logistical machines can break down during the right conditions. Um, so to me, that would be the only thing that they could have done at that point to even slow down the westward expansion of, of the U.S. And for that, it would have taken a lot of unity that, that perhaps was beyond um, the reconciliation of, the reconciliatory powers of, of any one nation. It's possible like that, uh, you know, there could have been several Tecumseh-like figures who rose up and said, hey, this is this is what we got to do. That's not to say that they, that inevitably um, they would have united or, or seen even common cause in fighting the, the Europeans. But I guess it's a, a greater possibility than what happened, which is they were driven to the brink of annihilation. Um, yeah, that, that that's about the only thing that I can see that could have, you know, ground down that, that, that manifest destiny machine that just kept expanding westward. It'd be a long, sustained campaign of disrupting supply lines. Treaties and federal laws gave Congress, not the states, authority over the tribes. The Indian Trade and Intercourse Act, passed by Congress in 1802, said there could be no land sessions except by treaty with a tribe, and said federal law would operate in Indian territory. Jackson ignored this and supported state action. It was in Again, the worst president in history, bar none. No one did more for the cause of, of genocide than Andrew Jackson. The absolute worst, worst president we have ever had. Um, utter hatred for Native Americans. Neat illustration of the uses of the federal system. Depending on the situation, blame could be put on the states or on something even more elusive, the mysterious law before which all men, sympathetic as they were to the Indian, must bow. As Secretary of War John Eaton explained to the Creeks of Alabama, Alabama itself was an Indian name, meaning here we may rest. Hmm. It is not your great father who does this, but the laws of the country, which he and every one of his people is bound to regard. The proper tactic had now been found. The Indians would not be forced to go west. So this is, this is kind of the, the, the sinister double-edged sword of, of proclaiming yourself to be a nation of laws and not men. Because that's never quite true. <laughs> There's always bias built in, and... 
the idea that somehow, you know, uh, just just uh, deferring to the law in every situation is going to have an objective, fair and balanced uh, result is, I mean, that's, that would be the height of naivete. Uh, the laws themselves are made by men. I know it's a big secret, but I'm letting you in on it. And just as though, just as, say, the Google algorithm is only as objective as the people that program it, so it can, you know, do things like um, have racist outputs when you're doing a Google Im image search, which it got in, in big trouble for, uh, just because all the people that, that were put into the image search as, as a testing, uh, you know, to, to feed the machine learning of the algorithm, just ha happened to almost entirely be white people. And so that's the only people that it saw as human in the, in the early days of, of Google image search. Um, that's not a flaw in the system, but it is a flaw in the architects of the system. They bake in their bias to that system just as you could have a, a system that has not a single racist actor, but the effect can still be racist. You know? Because it is it is it is constructed by by people, flawed uh, people who are not capable of seeing absolutely everything, let alone their own bias. So Again, that's the that's the danger in, in trying to make this into, or, or trying to say that we have a, a, a system of, of laws and not men. That's how you get people just deferring to the police in every situation because it's they're, they're just they're just enforcing the law. They're just doing their job. You know, um, when you when you make the pretense that your system is is inherently fair and logical and incapable of of coming out with a different result, then yeah, you're not going to see the, the many, many cases where that, that turns out not to be the case. Where it turns out there is a lot more bias in the system. Um, and and you know, people that, that really want to believe that the system is unbiased are going to double down in their assessments. Um, because to not do so, to admit that this supposedly logical system of facts and reason and, and uh, balanced consideration could come up with an unreasonable, unfair, and unbalanced result would threaten a large part of their own identity. Because, I mean, that, that's what it comes down to, is these people identify very much with the system. And so they need to believe. It's, it's the same reason that history books get... get uh, sanitized and whitewashed and glossed over. It's not necessarily a nefarious thing that, that people want to cover up the truth. It's just they start from a position of wanting to believe that, that the system is good and uh, that any flaws that they're even willing to admit all happened in the past and I mean, we don't do that anymore. And uh, but, but by and large, even back then, there was good reasons for it. Or you can at least sympathize with the 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 you know more simple backwards logic of people of the past and understand why they did it. But at least we're here at this this now greater point where we don't make such mistakes anymore. And so they can't look at books like this one, like a people's history, and take it as anything but just pure propaganda because they they don't want to admit that the system that they love so much that likely has been very good to them that usually is the reason that people really want to believe that the system is good is because it is good to them and to admit otherwise would, would be to admit that perhaps they don't deserve to have things so good while others don't um Yeah, to 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 admit that sort of thing would be to, yeah, put a put a, a just a little crack in the dam of their entire ideology, and then they may 
you know, might lead to a, 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 an existential crisis of, of how they view themselves and how they view the world. I just can't face that. So that's why they put aside these sorts of books or write them off as, as uh, just, you know, communist propaganda, which, of course, doesn't even need to be considered. Because who would consider such an uh, obviously ridiculous notion? Then again, <laughs> all throughout this book, you will hear mostly quotes and firsthand accounts and, and newspaper reports and that sort of thing of the people that live through it. That's why Zinn went about it as he did. He tried to editorialize as little as possible and just let people tell their own stories for that central reason that no matter what you want to believe, here is the most likely scenario of what happened. And here's a bunch of people that say so. That, that you know, um, don't have a vested interest in lying about the way things happened. At least not as much as the people that, that stood to look better through the lens of history if they did lie. But if they chose to stay, they would have to abide by state laws which destroyed their tribal and personal rights and made them subject to endless harassment and invasion by white settlers coveting their land. If they left... So freedom, in other words, right? That That's freedom they keep talking about bringing to the West. However, the federal government would give them financial support and promise them lands beyond the Mississippi. Jackson's instructions to an army major sent to talk to the Choctaws and Cherokees put it this way. Quote, Say to my red Choctaw children and my Chickasaw children to listen, my white children of Mississippi have extended their law over their country. Where they now are, say to them their father cannot prevent them from being subject to the laws of the state of Mississippi. The general government will be obliged to sustain the states in this exercise of their right. Say to the chiefs and warriors that I am their friend, that I wish to act as their friend, but they must, by removing from the limits of the states of Mississippi and Alabama, and by being settled on the lands I offer them, put it in my power to be such. There. Beyond the limits of any state, in possession of land of their own which they shall possess as long as grass grows or water runs, I am and will protect them and be their friend and father. Or you could just do it now and not force people to leave their, their lands that they've occupied for who knows how long. Certainly longer than you have. Um, but no, that, that was an impossibility. And... Yeah, uh, so, so here we have the, the title of the chapter, As Long as Grass Grows and Water Runs. So just showing the, the hypocrisy in that sort of a statement. Because as we know, what's coming next is that, oh, it's not actually as long as grass grows and water runs. It's just until enough white people want to keep going west. <laughs> that phrase... As long as grass grows or water runs, was to be recalled with bitterness by generations of Indians. An Indian GI veteran of Vietnam testifying publicly in 1970 not only about the horror of the war, but about his own maltreatment as an Indian, repeated that phrase and began to weep. As Jackson took office in 1829, gold was discovered in Cherokee Territory in Georgia. Thousands of whites invaded, destroyed Indian property, staked out claims. Jackson ordered federal troops to remove them, but also ordered Indians as well as whites to stop mining. Then he removed the troops. The whites returned, and Jackson said he could not interfere with Georgia's authority. The white invader. Oh, so we have an early version of states' rights, right? We're, we're allowing more freedom. We're just allowing the states to sort things out on their own. I mean, we could intervene and, and think of human rights and, and, you know, our duty to protect human beings. But, uh, you know, it's better just to let them all sort it out for themselves. And, of course, you'd only say that if you know that, that most of the time it's going to go in your way. Anyway, and you just don't have to get your hands dirty by making the pro 
proclamation yourself because then you can always differ oh it was them it was the it was, uh, georgia made their decision oh, oh, just as though or just as today it's oh pff, you know we're where the Supreme Court was uh, speaking in favor of, of greater freedom. It's the freedom of, of different states to de determine how or if they want uh, women to have reproductive rights. Um, well, let's just let them all decide. It's just so much, so much greater freedom than the, the federal government using its heavy hand to just decide something. And, and and just as as in the this case we're looking at in Georgia, with the Roe v. Wade being overturned, it's only done because they know that many of those states are going to make the same decision they want them to make. They want the freedom to be able to take away freedom from almost half the population. which is a, a very backwards way of looking at what freedom is. Uh, I go as far as to say it's not <laughs> being in the, the being the champion of freedom that they they I, I can't I can't imagine they actually believe that they're championing freedom. They don't want freedom. They want control. They want order. They are afraid of freedom. Freedom is chaos and anarchy to them. Order and control come from rules, regulations, and enforcement. seized land and stock, forced Indians to sign leases, beat up Indians who protested, sold alcohol to weaken resistance, killed game which Indians needed for food, but to put all the blame on white mobs, Rogan says, would be to ignore, quote, the essential roles played by planter interests and government policy decisions. Food shortages, Whiskey and military attacks began a process of tribal disintegration. Violence by Indians upon other Indians increased. Treaties made under pressure and by deception broke up the Creek, Choctaw, and Chickasaw tribal lands into individual holdings, making each person a prey to contractors, speculators, and politicians. The Chickasaw sold their land individually at good prices and went west without much suffering. The Creeks and Choctaws remained on their individual plots, but great numbers of them were defrauded by land companies. According to one president, a stockholder land company, quote, stealing is the order of the day. In complaint to Watton and Lewis Cass replied, our citizens were disposed to buy and the Indians to sell. The subsequent disposition which shall be made of these payments seems to be utterly beyond the reach of the government. The improvident habits of the Indian cannot be controlled by regulations. If they waste it, as waste it they too often will, it is deeply to be regretted, yet still it is only exercising a right conferred upon them by the treaty. I mean, that all sounds incredibly familiar again. With, with the, the, the conservatives' attitude toward any sort of government program that could actually help people. It, it, they always frame it just as Jordan Peterson does, where it's just, it's a situation that's beyond uh, uh, repair. And, and, and the idea that, that any government help is, is only going to uh, make the situation worse, you know, create dependency, you know, it never have statistics or, or any sort of facts to back that up it's it's all just the feels but they just kind of believe it because they want to believe it because it it, it uh, releases them from any obligation to really try and solve problems to really care for fellow citizens uh, so yeah it's the same sort of thing and then they look down and infantilize the, the poor just as, as these uh, government officials were looking down and infantilizing the Native Americans. It's basically the same mentality. We have things good, so we must be the true adults and the true inheritors of, of anything we see fit to inherit. Uh, you all don't even know what to do with the stuff that you have, so you don't deserve it in the first place. You would only waste it. 
it's, it's the same thing as is the you know the the um uh not apocryphal what's, what's the word for it the the uh Uh, you know the the the. It, it's like it's like the idea of the welfare queen, or the, the you know the people that, you know all those all those stories that that always crop up here and there of of people on EBT buying lobster and, you know, uh, poor people just don't know how to manage their own finances. So of course they waste it. On, and we certainly couldn't allow them to use it on anything like heated food because then they just waste it even faster. They don't deserve the luxury of heated food, only cold. And they should be lucky to get anything at all, because they don't really deserve it. They just, uh, we're doing this out of charity. And there's that word, charity, which always comes with a moral con condemnation and a feeling of moral su superiority to whoever is receiving the charity. And that's, that's part of the point of having it that way, because then you get to be the big savior of, of anyone who you deem worthy. And you get to, to met out who is worthy of, of being saved and not by your charity. So if someone doesn't live up to your moral standards, they don't get your charity. Um, not so is the case with social programs. Everyone who meets certain qualifications gets it, whether or not they are, uh, you know, there's no moral purity test in order to, say, receive free and reduced lunch as, as, a, as a student uh, or subsidized housing. You know, they, they, I mean, there is still some, they've managed to, to pack in some things in there, like, um, you know, you can't have extra people living with you. You can't have certain infractions against the law, um, or you just you lose it all. So they still manage to pack in some <laughs> some of that the, those notions of charity into social welfare programs, but it's not quite as complete. You know, there's a reason that that say Salvation Army loves to have people come into their soup kitchens because then they can preach at them about how terrible they are and how they, they uh, don't really deserve the food they're getting, so they should be super grateful that they're getting it at all, and all these sorts of things. It's all right, James. It's, it's, it's okay if you were... I, I know that, uh, yeah, Rob was, was streaming at the same time as, as I was. Um, no, it's not the last five minutes. We still got about 40 minutes to go, so we got a big chunk to cover still. How was, how was uh, the For We Are Many stream? I didn't have much of a chance. I didn't have a chance to check in with it at all myself because I was getting stuff for Amanda who um, is sick with COVID. And, uh, and then I had to quickly eat dinner before I started streaming myself. So I, I hadn't had the chance to check in with For We Are Many. But I always do like what they do. Um, anyway. Let's continue on in the text here a little bit. The Creeks, defrauded of their land, short of money and food, refused to go west. Starving Creeks began raiding white farms while Georgia militia and settlers attacked Indian settlements. Thus began the Second Creek War. One Alabama newspaper sympathetic to the Indians wrote, quote, The war with the Creeks is all humbug. It is a base and diabolical scheme devised by interested men to keep an ignorant race of people from maintaining their just rights and to deprive them of the small remaining pittance placed under their control. A Creek man... That sounds like it was likely true. They, they were taking advantage of desperate people in order to fleece them and get more of what they want. And again, hey, parallels to, to today. This whole notion that, that it's only possible to have a society run on the, on the threat of work or starve, otherwise too many people will just be layabouts, uh, comes from that same sort of intent in that they want people to be desperate willing to take anything, because then they will always take less. 
so yeah, I mean it, it seems to me that this is exactly the sort of situation that they are talking about here trying to push desperate people into war so they can feel morally justified in slaughtering them and taking their lands <laughs> that's all right James you don't have to pledge loyalty to, to one or the other of us I'm, I'm happy that you were uh, able to be in the audience for, for We Are Many. They, they definitely deserve it, you know. They deserve every bit of, uh, you know, recognition as, as uh, yeah, any of us here in the Left Signal Boost TV collective. More than a hundred years old, named Speckled Snake, reacted to Andrew Jackson's policy of removal. Brothers! I have listened to many talks from our great white father. When he first came over the wide waters, he was but a little man, very little. His legs were cramped by sitting long in his big boat, and he begged for a little land to light his fire on. But when the white man had warmed himself before the Indian's fire and filled himself with their harmony, he became very large. With a step, he bestrode the mountains, and his feet covered the plains and the valleys. His hand grasped the eastern and the western sea, and his head rested on the moon. Then he became our great father. He loved his red children, and he said, Get a little further, lest I tread on thee. Brothers, I have listened to a great many talks from our great father, but they always began and ended in this. Get a little further. You are too near me. Again, we hear... Such poetry and eloquence from the, the people who have been branded by uh, wealthy landowners as, as being uncivilized. People in, in need of civilization, but, but tragically uh, unable to take advantage of, you know, just unable to be civilized, you know, just inherently children of the woods. Um, and yet here we are, another another very eloquent speech by a Native American leader, uh, one to rival anything that was was said by any of the uh, you know white luminaries of the time. Kind of strange that it's almost as though civilization has very little to do with technological advancement, and only to do with social advancement. <laughs> Dale Van Every, in his book, The Disinherited, sums up what removal meant to the Indian. In the long record of man's inhumanity, exile has wrung moans of anguish from many different peoples. Upon no people could it ever have fallen with a more shattering impact than upon the Eastern Indians. The Indian was peculiarly susceptible to every sensory attribute of every natural feature of his surroundings. He lived in the open. He knew every marsh, glade, hilltop, rock, spring, creek, as only the hunter can know them. He had never fully grasped the principle establishing private ownership of land as any more rational than private ownership of air. Okay. Important to define that term. Private ownership. Well, it can mean many things. Uh, a couple different things in this case. Uh, it could mean just the the ownership of the means of production, as as a <coughs> Marxist critique of of things, where uh, private ownership means you own the land or the machinery, um, you hold the jobs in your hand for for that people need and depend on for their survival, and are therefore. Therefore, you feel justified in taking whatever profit you think you can get away with from that endeavor. So, different, different from uh, from personal property, which is just things like your house, your car, the things you need to survive and go about your daily life. Private ownership could also mean, as opposed to collective ownership, um, think of think of like living in a, a nuclear family there's no real private ownership like you know you might have your own toys and your siblings might have their toys and once you get older you know you you might uh, have your own car even but you're still 
expected that if need be that, that you share those resources and you expect the same you know you expect to perhaps be able to use your parents car or or make use of your parents money uh it's it there's there's not the hard and fast lines it's it's like you wouldn't necessarily just go into your neighbor's yard and take their lawnmower and use it but you would go into your parents shed and take their lawnmower and use it if you needed to that sort of a thing so either way uh, you know, I'm sure both of those concepts were pretty foreign to a lot of people living in tribal life because tribal life tends to be just more collective if for no other reason then you kind of have to be um, especially with nomadic lives it's it's difficult to hoard a lot of stuff because anything you hoard you have to then take with you as you move around according to the seasons um, and it's just it's just not as easy when you're when you're just living straight off the land to to hoard as much you know you depend on other people it's clear that they depend on you too the, these these things are not we haven't created these fictions the way that you know right libertarians create the fiction that they can somehow have their own private property that the government has absolutely nothing to do with and that uh that's <laughs> that system will somehow work in the <clears throat> in the absence of any ultimate uh arbiter of of truth and justice so with the advent of private property you do have more of an illusion that that things are separate that you aren't reliant on other people even though everyone is reliant on everybody else and there's a reason that very few people choose a life of complete solitude you know they, they don't go off into the woods and be a hermit it's an incredibly difficult life that is not really suited towards most of humanity um, it is not our survival strategy for sure we are a collective species, a communal species, even. <clears throat> Welcome in, Radical Disability. So you were saying that you were going to share that yesterday debated someone left-wing on what Marx defines commodity, like it was laughable because they said, I was saying use value, and you were not. Okay. Yeah, Marx was all about uh, the labor theory of value. So I believe he acknowledged that that use value does come into play, you know, when you're setting a price for something like you, you for instance, you could have a, a, a widget factory that, that makes widgets that fall out of fashion that nobody wants anymore. And of course, it doesn't matter anymore how much labor is going into making those widgets. If they're unable to be sold to anyone, they effectively have no value. Oh, thanks for the cheer, Alyosha. Welcome in, Alyosha. Oh, I meant to shout you out last time, but I, I for some reason, I, I took leave of my senses and I did not. So follow Alyosha, everybody. Uh, oh, I got to type it into the chat. My mistake. Everyone follow Alyosha. Real great streamer. Yeah, that's right, James was just talking about Alyosha earlier and how he has been enjoying your stream a whole lot too, Ali. So anyway, I believe that, that Marx um, recognized that, that some use theory of value was, was valid, but he, of course, would not have taken it to be the be-all, end-all, as so many uh, capitalist sympathizers like to pretend so like you know uh to someone starving of thirst in or someone dying of thirst in the desert a, a bottle of water is is infinitely valuable like yeah that's true but also that bottle of water would not exist without the labor that produced it so if something cannot exist without the the act of labor producing it at least some of that value has to come from the labor right <laughs> so you can't just completely discard labor theory of value either commodity is any object uh, this is what they what it is and stop but a commodity in use is anything that satisfies a human need 
this is the use value, like there's a static material and an active material in an economy, this fundamental. Uh, oh, like there is a static material and an active material uh, in the economy, this fundamental. I'm an orthodox Marxist, and even I know this. Yeah, well, okay. So how I understand commodity is something that can be something that has an elastic price, something that, that depending on supply and demand, you can jack up the price or, or, or lower the price on. That's what commodification is, making something into a product or a service that you can then sell um, that has a, an elastic demand. Well, we will, we'll, you know, depend largely on um, how in, in vogue something is to be had um, and other factors other than necessity. And that's where we run into problems in capitalist economies is because they will commoditize everything. So housing, though it has an inelastic demand, everyone needs a place to, to live. Now there's some elastic demand, people that have second houses or investment properties and stuff like that, sure. There's some elasticity to that demand, but everyone needs a baseline place to live. So the idea that it should be tied to the laws of supply and demand makes no sense because there will always be, demand will never go away. So it's not, it's not something that, that is going to, <clears throat> that should be tied to whether or not people want it because people always have to have it, you know? It just depends on whether they have it for themselves or they're paying for it on behalf of a landlord um, for the benefit of a landlord. So, so there's that. Same thing happens with food. Everybody's got to eat. And in this day and age, very, pe very few people are even semi-subsistence in their, their productivity. So the idea that food should be subject to the laws of supply and demand means that sometimes people should starve, just like yeah, putting housing into the market as, as a commodity means that sometimes, according to the market, some people should go without housing. And so we're already getting into territory that seems to me quite cruel and heartless that you could ever justify a scenario that, divide, that deprives people of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness in the name of having a freer market. Ah, I don't like that at all. So Radical Disability says, well, the product is under the umbrella of commodity, like Marx used a broad brush of what it is. So the elastic thing is the satisfaction of humanity. Okay. Let me let me let me digest that a little bit here. <clears throat> yeah, I guess I guess I'm I'm still still struggling to see where the where the conflict between your your two definitions. You talked about this argument you, argument that you had. Um, so what is you? How does your definition of commodity differ from theirs? Anyway, the, the baseline, whatever you call it, in my view, things that, that, that everyone needs for, the, for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness should be provided to them regardless of, of their ability to pay. You should not be able to be deprived of your life for lack of health care or for lack of ability to purchase food. You should not be able to be deprived of, you know, pursuing whatever makes you happy in the world for lack of transportation or the necessary education to have the, the correct um, expertise to pursue it, correct training. <clears throat> so, Ali is asking, uh, was not Karl Marx in the 19th century? how to modernize his social theories. And moreover, there were not billions of people in the world as right now. I think there was maybe a billion people during the time of Marx. I think they may have hit that point because industrialization was really taking off. 
and uh, uh, the, the consumer economy was certainly starting to ramp up. We're starting to transfer or transition to making stuff en masse, basically. And then needing to find markets for all that extra stuff we were producing. Um, but yeah, uh, of course we shouldn't just be beholden to any thinker that doesn't live in the modern era. Because they can't possibly... They couldn't have possibly anticipated everything the way that the world was going to go. And there's going to be, <coughs> excuse me, different material circumstances today, which I would think that even Marx, or especially Marx, in fact, would agree uh, changes how we should uh, view things. We shouldn't just view everything through his lens because he had different material conditions. And material conditions are what, more than anything, sets up what is possible in society, um, what is possible for individuals, um, and uh, what it, what is going to impel them to want change or want the the same as they have. Anyway, I think we should uh, continue on in the book just a little bit more as we all kind of digest that sort of that stuff. So but he loved the on. land with a deeper emotion than could any proprietor. He felt himself as much a part of it as the rocks and trees, the animals and birds. His homeland was a holy ground, sanctified for him as the resting place of the bones of his ancestors and the natural shrine of his religion. Okay. So I think there's a little bit of danger in, in thinking of Native Americans in this way. This, this, this seems to be treading quite close to like the noble savage conception of, of Native Americans, where they're just, you know, uh, completely one with the earth and, and in complete balance with it and have none of the problems of, of modern day people, but at the same time are, are kind of naive and, and again, childlike. That always goes along with the, the conception of the noble savage. So I think what, what the, the passage we just read is getting a little bit too close for my comfort is the idea that, that uh, yeah, there was something inherently noble and, and better and simpler in every sense of the word about the way Native Americans lived. That's not, that's not true. There were Native American groups that, that outstripped the, the capacity of the land they were on to uh, sustain them. They were, they, were, they were more warlike and less warlike uh, uh, groups and tribes. And those positions changed throughout time. Um, None of them were static in one thing for, for their entire past. Um, so I think it's, it's better to think of them as just regular people, uh, very much like us. Um, yeah, us, yeah. Um, very much like anyone else, you know, the, the, the same sort of distribution of... Uh, talents and, and skills and ideas, ambitions, and, and flaws and fallacies as any other group you're going to find. I don't think it does them any service to either put them on a pedestal or put yourselves on a pedestal above them um, now or in the past. Uh, the differences are mainly material. Um, so, we, I mean, it could have been that, that a, a, a Civilization such as, as the Aztecs could have continued on and risen up and become um, a conquering empire similar to uh, the Europeans. Or, or some other civilization could have arose and done the same thing, given the same material circumstances and the right cultural attitudes to do so. Um, so, yeah. But at the same time, people that live on the land and, and are dependent much more directly and, and obviously uh, as, as they would have been on the, 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 the land right around them are just naturally going to be more connected to it. They're going to feel more connected to it. 
they're going to literally be more connected to it, not not really dependent on far flung supply lines of, of things that, you know, resources that they don't see growing up and and being able to be harvested locally. So I think that is a consequence of, of just being closer to the land. Um, but to assign some like holier than anything else possible, um, it's just, I, I, I don't think it does anyone any services really. Okay, so back to what we were talking about with radical disability. Well, they were, they were saying that any object is equal to the satisfaction of human need. Uh, this is not a fair interpretation or a good faith blurb of what Marx said. Absolutely not. <laughs> no, Marx, like I said, first and foremost, put forth the labor theory of value that, that because goods and services cannot exist just by, you know, literally throwing money at it and, and hoping that your machinery moves on its own. And, you know, even if you had a fully automated factory it would still require humans to intervene to program the, the, the machines, to maintain the machine, stuff like that. Because there is no value without labor, labor is the most important way to measure value. And if labor produces all value, then labor is deserving of the spoils of, of that value, more so than someone who just makes their money by owning. So yeah, that, that flies in the face of private property in the idea of just one person through accident of birth, uh, having more resources than, than most everyone around them and being able to leverage that, that hoarding of resources into extracting uh, value out of workers for themselves because they just happen to be owners so they get to decide what to do with the profits. Uh, profit is another term that really needs to be defined because profit is what's left over after all workers have been paid. It's what the, the people that are the owners then get to decide what to do with. Usually they give it to themselves, <laughs> strangely enough. Um, they, they mostly decide that they are most deserving because, oh, hey, without them, there wouldn't have been jobs in the first place. So, you know, they, they, they do the... <laughs> the lion's share of the owning, so they deserve the lion's share of the profit. So, in a Marxist system, in, or in a system that, that follows the principles of Marx, where if you produce the thing, you are deserving of the product of that thing, first and foremost, not to say exclusively, like there still needs to be room for um, people that, that are unable to uh, uh, work or work as much as, as others, or for whatever reason, just don't work as much as others. They still should be provided for. They still are human beings and deserving of continued exi existence. As I said, nothing you should do in your life should ever deprive you of life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness. No choice you make, no mistake you make, no, no intentional sabotage of your own designs should ever make you de deprived of life, liberty, or the pursuit of happiness. So that means even if you just decide to kick your feet up, completely able-bodied, I still think you deserve to live. <laughs> and, and apparently that's very radical in this, this day and age, but uh, there you have it. So anyway, back to Radical Disability, who says, but historical materialism shares that uh, we do not have to view it in, the, in his lens in order to do comparative study of his material conditions and our material conditions. This is the problem we skip historical materialism and become un undialectical. Absolutely. Good point. So, so, so yeah, I think that's an answer to your question, Ali, that Marx himself would agree that, you know, we shouldn't just take his view of the world. We should take the conditions as they are and then decide how we want to shape the world of today. Do we want to have a, a system that, that, um, oh, hello, perennial green. That's Amanda, uh, who's recovering from COVID and yeah, it's been, 
it's been a, a, a mild case so far, thankfully, but yeah, I, I, we've, we've, we've been so careful. We got all our vaccinations and our boosters. So I guess all we can say now is, that, you know, at least it's a milder case. She has not ended up in the hospital as other family members have who are unvaccinated. Um, so it's definitely good that, that we got, yeah, yeah, Amanda got COVID. And, and I might be coming down with it myself. I do feel congestion. I feel a bit of a scratchy throat, but it's, I don't have full blown symptoms yet. And I tested negative this morning, but we'll see it tomorrow. And yeah, she's lost her sense of taste, which is really sad. Oh, but anyway, so uh, <clears throat> back to what has, what um, Radical Disability was saying. Yeah, I am. I am. Yeah, you're right. I, I've started to cough a little bit. It's not. Uh, again, it's not in in the realm of like full blown uh, symptoms or anything. But I do cough from time time to time. So I may be headed in that direction. Yeah, I need to retest tomorrow morning. <clears throat> anyway, back to what radical disability was saying. Historical materialism is important. We have to, to view historical events as, as being shaped largely by material realities. So again, uh, because Europeans found themselves in a, a, a position to have material superiority over most of the rest of the world, they were able to enact these ideas of, of manifest destiny. Now, had they had, a, say, a <clears throat> more egalitarian society and those material conditions to, to think that they would have just done the same thing, I wouldn't be so, I wouldn't be so confident in that. You know, thinking of a, a, a much less hierarchical society and them all collectively deciding, yeah, these, these people are subhuman. We need to go exterminate them to have land for us. I'd say that's a, a much less likely scenario. So they could have the same material conditions, but make different choices. Um, that's, a, that's a big lesson that I've, I've, I've taken from reading David Graeber a lot. The idea that, that, that there's, you know, just material conditions are not enough to explain why two cultures right next to each other with basically the same material abilities make different cultural decisions, um, have more or less hierarchically structured societies, are more or less aggressive towards their neighbors, um, things like that. So that can't explain that. <laughs> So there has to be more at play than just material conditions. Um, which means that, that the idea that Manifest Destiny was going to roll out the way it did across North America was not inevitable. It's, it's, we weren't just locked on historical rails and had to make the decisions that we did. I don't, I, I don't think that can be persuasively argued otherwise. Uh, Marx had to leave Prussia and Germany because he had to survive like they were uh, going to kill him. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Um, so, so for sure, Marx's material conditions shaped the way that his life went. However, had, uh, had he found Prussia or, or Germany in a, you know, in a state, well, especially, I, I don't know where Prussia covers right now, because it no longer is a country. Um, but I can, I can speak about Germany, which is, is more or less the same geographical space as back then. Had Germany been more like the Germany of today rather than back then, um, perhaps he wouldn't have been forced out. Um, there, they, you could have had this again the same material conditions but a different cultural inertia we'll call it and things could have gone differently so i mean otherwise if if everything is just driven by pure material conditions then i mean there's no chance of steering things 
in a different direction. Everything is already set. Everything is, is just set on rails. We have no agency, no, no control over the destiny of humanity. We are all just along for the ride in that case. And that could be the reality, but it doesn't seem like it to me. Otherwise, we would get the same results time and time and time again. That would be my assumption. And yet, as David Graeber pointed out, we have plenty of examples of pluralities. Uh, plurality, I don't know if that's the, the right word. We have cultural splits in regions that had basically the same material conditions that you know, literally were right next to each other. So I think it would always play out the same way if things were that inevitable. But we need to, to take in material conditions into account too, you know? Uh, as, as long as, as most Americans are materially comfortable, they're likely going to support the, the current system. They're not going to really push for any real change. Um, I think overall that, that's going to be true. But that doesn't mean we don't stop trying to, to push for change. I think we can have a, a affect a change in culture. I think we are in the midst of a change in cultural uh, direction, I guess, for lack of a better word. And it is partially being spurred on by a change in material conditions, but also just the, you know, better ideas, in my opinion, gaining more currency. Because there are two ways that, that cultures can split, that uh, cultures tend to split when they're met with a lot of pressure. Um, they tend to either draw everything up, become very um, distrustful of, of outsiders and others, put all of their, their hopes and their, their um, faith into, you know, strong men leaders. To, to save them from uh, destruction, um, they, trend, they, they, they trend towards the fascist side. So that's one direction. And the other direction tends to be towards, you know, a shared sense of, of, of being all in this together and the idea of us coming together, helping one another out as the best way to get out of bad situations. So, it I mean, it really is communism or barbarism, in my mind, when, when, when cultures are pushed towards um, times of great stress and upheaval. Pressure was in the northwest of Germany. Okay. It was dystopian. Yeah. So who knows? Marx could have had a, a vastly different life. Um, but perhaps he would not have been in a place to, you know, come into contact with Friedrich Engels and been able to have him as a, a rich benefactor and given him the time and leisure to actually write something as, as amazing as, as Das Kapital, uh, which we will cover on the stream eventually, but that's a, that's a big enchilada to get through. Even, vol even one volume of it is going to take probably more than a year to cover. So I've kind of been putting it off a little bit. But I keep saying this is going to... Once we get to it, it will kind of mark uh, the end of, the, of phase one for this streaming channel, for this, you know, whatever you want to call it, podcast, channel, whatever. And we will not spend as much time with the classics after that point and move towards a more intersectional view of things. And then, you know, getting into people's history of the United States has been, you know, just dipping a toe in, in that. I mean, it's still told by a white man um, who I'm sure had his own biases, but he includes so much perspective from... You know, I and mean, he went out of his way to tell the stories of the most downtrodden people of the time that it has a lot more mm, heft to it, I would say.
charts that um oh <laughs> sorry, sorry that that word got uh auto modded i still haven't figured out how to because there are certain words that i don't allow in chat and apparently the auto mod is pretty dumb about that so if those words appear in any part of of you know if they're contained within any other word so you said simplify and it uh it uh it censored the first half of that word because the first half of that word by itself is one that's not allowed because it's not allowed on Twitch. And I just, you know, I don't want to bother with people coming in and, and saying things that can get me canceled on Twitch or banned off of Twitch or whatever. Twitches. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Twitches. Oh. I don't know if anyone watches me on Twitch, uh, or I, I'm sorry, not on Twitch. On, I was thinking of Twitter. Um, I, I, I do technically broadcast it to Twitter as well, but I don't know how many people watch that. <laughs> anyway, good conversation. I really do appreciate your, your comments and questions. Uh, well, everybody, it's all been very good. I always enjoy having you all here. But uh, let's see. Oh, we are at the 9 o'clock hour. So we're going to get to the end of the next paragraph. And then we're going to stop it for the night. He conceived its waterfalls and ridges, its clouds and mists, its glens and meadows to be inhabited by the myriad of spirits with whom he held daily communion. It was from this rain-washed land of forests, streams, and lakes to which he was held by the traditions of his forebears and his own spiritual aspirations that he was to be driven to the arid, treeless plains of the far west, a desolate region, then universally known as the Great American Desert. All right, that's the end of that. So this was a sympathetic view of the Native Americans. And I, you know, as I was trying to argue, I don't know that it's necessarily doing them justice either by putting them as this kind of mystical other. Because I, th I think it's more important to just view people as people. Make that the baseline assumption. Not exotic, not, you know, uh, debaucherous or, or primitive or advanced or any of these other ways that we differentiate how we think of others or the other. I think a better way to go about the entire thing is to just start from the assumption that they're basically like anyone else. They're going to be assholes among them. There's going to be really righteous, altruistic people among them. There's going to be the eloquent, the, uh, you know, the, the not so eloquent. There's going to be reactionaries and, and people that want progress. Um, all flavors of people. And the main differences are really going to be material conditions. You know, a, a, you know, a, a culture that is, is founded in the desert is going to take on the desert, whether it, you know, whether it, or not it uh, bathes itself in air conditioning 24-7 or not. The desert is still going to play a part in its psyche. Um, a, a, a culture that is by the ocean is going to be different from one that grows up in the mountains. You're just naturally going to think of things differently have different metaphors. Um, a lot of the metaphors that, that are kind of older in, in American culture, chickens coming home to roost, why buy the cow if you get the milk for free? A lot of them are very agrarian, and that comes from a time when America was very agrarian. So even though we're, we're largely not agrarian anymore, the, the land itself shapes the way that we think of things, shapes the way that the culture goes. And that's going to be the case wherever you go. So I think just assuming that the main differences among people are going to be things like material circumstances they find themselves in and whatever cultural mores have managed to get to the top, um, uh, come to the forefront of, of the collective psyche of, of the people, those are going to be the main differences, you know. I think we'll all be better off if we just make that our baseline assumption rather than, you know, mystifying the other or denigrating the other and assuming one of those two is the only possibility. But I think that's enough for tonight.
So we will continue on next week. Uh, we'll be, um, let's see, I think we are, what? We're only halfway through the chapter. So we got a ways to go. Probably a couple more installments, depending on how fast we get through them. And, uh, but we'll pick it up next Monday at uh, 7 p.m. Central Standard. Got a little bit of a late start today, but like I said, I was running around a lot, so just happened to be how things went. Um, that's going to be... Uh, so the next time I stream, though, will be Sunday. It'll be with Dan Platt again, and we'll be doing reactions to, to politics. And, yeah, yeah, he always surprises me with the, the cool stuff that he brings up to, to discuss. So it's always a good show with Dan Platt of the Three Left Show, another member of Left Single Boost TV. Um, definitely go check out Left Signal, Left Signal Boost TV on uh, on Facebook. You know, they, we're, we're trying to create, trying to eke out a a bright spot amongst uh, a sea of reaction and boomer posting and stuff like that. So anyway, we, we, we all banded together under the banner of Left Single Boost TV. There's uh, 12, 13 of us now, and uh, we all post to that same page. So you can get a lot of different live streams, a lot of different content posted there, find out about a lot of different leftists, and, and we, we take all, all types except for <laughs> Pat socks and uh, others that... that really have no business calling themselves on the left. But, you know, MLs, uh, uh, Leninists, I mean, Trotskyists, uh, anarchists, um, maybe even anarcho-primitivists, but none of, have, none of those have, have come through requesting membership yet, so we'll see. <laughs> but anyway, we are, we are a multi-tendency umbrella group. All just trying to help out, push back against the the inherent reactionary nature of Facebook and its dreaded algorithm that stomps on our collective faces endlessly, forever. All right, that's enough of that. Uh, let's see who is on tonight, and we will start a raid. Riverboat Jack's jumping out. Someone we have not raided into recently, although I think, I think last time they denied our raid, so. Let's see who else is on. Oh, Hassan's on right now. He's not going to notice a, <laughs> not going to notice a raid of six. Not that I don't appreciate each and every one of you. I absolutely do. Um, let's see what Chapo Trap House is up to. Not likely to be noticed in that stream either, but there's some chance anyway. So they're doing Pokemon Games Anime RT for Eternal Glory. I'm not quite sure what's happening there, so I think we'll just move on from them. Let's see who else is on then. All right, remember about Jack's talking about Brazil, so maybe we will raid into their channel. Are they playing DK64? Oh, I sure hope so. That was one of my favorite games of N64. So if you're coming at this from some other place or some other time uh, than Twitch, and you want to check out a cool leftist streamer, go check out Riverboat Jack. And we will try and begin the raid there. And if we can't, if we can't raid there, then, then we'll take your suggestion and we'll do Epic Prong, because I know for sure that he will accept the raid. So we'll see. So stick tight or sit tight. Oh, I have another dang commercial for me. Anyway, sit tight for the raid. Thanks for joining me. Hope to see you all next Sunday for, for stuff with uh, Dan Platt.
Oh, no, I didn't mean to clip that. No, I didn't mean to do that. Dang it. I pressed clip instead of... That's going to be a real great clip. Me trying to figure out who to raid into. <laughs> Press the wrong button. That's not... Uh, why is it doing that? It's really not liking that. Ah, oh, see if I can figure out how to do the raid thing again. Here we go, Riverboat Jack. Hopefully they will accept, otherwise we'll do Epic Brawn. It looks like they're accepting. Very cool. I'm sure you will like their stuff. Make sure to behave in their stream. Um, they're very cool. So here we go, starting the raid. <laughs> 